things like snakes are able to learn learn really complex behaviors uh, both in the wild and captivity uh, and emotions what are emotions so there's the triune triune brain was the old one the three uh the, the, the three-parted brain so you've got the inner reptile brain then the limbic brain and the neocortex um he went out to india found some leopard geckos and before he, he spoke about it he went and confirmed the species um uh, for dna work that they are the exact ones that we keep in captivity and they're in wet woodland mussy wet cool woodland it can be beneficial for us to imagine ourselves as an animal as the animal we're thinking of and talking about imagine yourself as that snake not with a human mind imagine yourself as that snake with the snake's body the snake's thoughts the snake's experiences from young up until its point as far as you can and use that to guide how you think about that animal's life Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Ricky Johnson, who is a reptile keeper out of the UK. He is also heavily involved with the Advancing Herpetological Husbandry Facebook group, as well as the conference that they put on. He is an animal care technician at a college. We discussed that, the, the sort of giant herptile collection that he has there. I shouldn't say giant, but very substantial herptile collection with reptiles and amphibians. So that, that's fascinating. And he is also a member of the Herp HQ YouTube channel. Now, Herp HQ may ring a bell. We've had the other member of that channel on the on the podcast podcast before. That's Sam Parrott. Sam is the lighting genius or lighting wizard, whatever you want to call him. He's doing some insane projects with lighting. So you can go back to those episodes if you want more information on that. But Ricky Johnson is also involved with Herp HQ and he has recently started his own educational series on that channel. And they're absolutely mind blowing. He's done such a great job so far. He's released two and I know there are many more in the works. So in this episode, we discuss his plans with those videos and we break down two the two videos that he has put together. The first one, we discuss reptile emotions and reptile intelligence. And that was a a really great thorough discussion and then we also discuss leopard geckos where do they exist in the wild what does their na native habitat look like how far or how wrong are we with a lot of this sort of cookie cutter care sheet care guides and ricky talks about some incredible studies and data that's in the field from wild leopard geckos and how wrong some of our care is with those species. And we discuss how robust and durable species get the worst treatment because they can really handle anything. So that was a fascinating part of this conversation as well. And we wrap up the conversation discussing the advancing herpetological husbandry conference which was on march 12th and 13th and ricky kind of lays out what to expect at the conference of course the conference is already over but when we recorded this conversation it hadn't happened yet and we discuss for those of you who weren't able to attend like myself if there's any opportunity for us to watch the presentations that took place because there were some seriously big names there so i'm really hoping that eventually i get a chance to watch what took place because it sounded amazing now before i hit play on this episode make sure you head to animals at home network.com if you're looking for more information on this episode you can find the show notes for everything there if you are interested in an animals at home t-shirt or sweater you can find the link to the shop there five dollars does automatically get donated to the amazon rainforest conservancy and if you are interested in joining us on patreon you can find us at patreon.com slash animals at home that is a really great way to support the podcast you can support it for as little as three dollars a month or five dollars a month if you hit the five dollar month tier there are a few bonuses like early access to episodes as well as the opportunity to join me in a zoom chat with a few of the other listeners and uh, members of Liam's channel from Reptiles and Research and we kind of just have a fun meeting and we chat reptiles usually about once a month and as you guys know I just had a baby a couple months or, a, or my wife had a baby a couple of weeks ago so life is still really hectic and I'm not able to fall onto a normal release pattern normally I was going every single Sunday I did that for like a year and a half straight and now it's just going to be kind of when I get those episodes out I'm quickly realizing it's going to be very difficult for me to get back to my normal schedule. So I am very seriously contemplating outsourcing my editing, which is a little bit scary for me because I do like to have some control, but it also comes with a massive expense 
probably about four or $500 a month to edit my four episodes. So if you are enjoying the podcast and you want to see it get back to consistent episodes, Patreon is a great way to help me pay for that. Right now, the podcast is making about that much money, so I would really be investing all the money back from the podcast into editing, but I do want to get back to producing consistent episodes. So if you want to see that and you think it's a good idea that I outsource the editing so I can just focus on recording, let me know because it's a little bit of a scary move. And finally, thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for anything reptile related, make sure you head to the affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. All right. Let's jump into the episode. Enjoy. Well, Ricky, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. No worries. Hello, Dylan. I'm very much looking forward to chatting with you. I was, as we were just saying off air, I think you're a sort of a hidden gem at this point. You've just started to put out some content. And, and that's what I love about the podcast is I can find people who are either not producing content and maybe they never want to go down the content path and just have a bunch of knowledge or people who are just starting to, we know YouTube is full of everything when it comes to great information to horrible information and the more we can promote those people doing the good stuff uh, the better and so we'll get into all that because I know there's lots to talk about with you but first maybe we could just kind of have a little background about yourself as far as where your journey with reptiles started or animals started and and where you've gone through education and and work-wise. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, to be fair I've only been in the the hobby for probably just over a decade which really isn't that long um especially if you compare it to other people that are big names in the industry and hobby a decade is practically nothing Mm -hmm. um but yeah so i got into it mainly straight into education so uh people in the uk will be used to the the um qualifications i'll mention uh, I'm not sure how they compare to the US, but uh, I started, I joined in at college um, on a level three animal management extended diploma um, and basically went from there. My interest in my keeping and study started, and my keeping started just before my study. I started with the classic stuff, a corn snake, um, a couple, um, a couple regius, a couple royal pythons or ball pythons. Um, and uh, a couple blue tongues, blue tongue skinks, and that started me off. And then I got obsessed with skinks. That was brilliant. Uh, a few people will know me mainly for being a skink dude, skink guy. Um, so as I went through a few years of study, my collection at home grew and grew and grew, and it definitely was uh, focused around skinks. Um, so that grew and grew from there. And I just got more and more invested in the welfare side of, of the hobby. So the first few years I got meeting more people, speaking to more people, seeing more online and finding myself really disappointed, um, disappointed with information, disappointed with, uh, the quality of, of keeping of husbandry of animals as someone relatively fresh at the time, only a few years in, um, I didn't really follow, um, guides that you see online. Mm. It, I don't know how it happened like that, but I, I found a lot of them were insufficient and I definitely was that student that always wanted to correct people, um, self, self, uh, self um admitted i am that guy <laughs> or i was that guy now i'm paid to be that guy <laughs> um, yeah there's the difference um so yeah after the level three um i also did a high national diploma um which is like a lower degree level um and then at the last year of that i was an intern at my place of work that i currently am where i studied um as an animal care technician. And then they took me on as a a full-time worker. Um, And actually since then, my collection has diminished uh, for a few reasons, but part of it is that with caring for a a work collection, a sizable work collection, um, I don't see, I I don't feel much of a need to keep at home Mm. to keep many species, to keep many animals at home because I'll go to work work with dozens of species, do all the same things you'd do as a hobbyist and then come home and I just don't want to do any more of it because I've done it all day. (laughs) Enough cleaning enclosures for one day. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So and, was um, the animal management, the original anim- animal management diploma, was that focused on any sort of class of animals in particular or was it just sort of a scattershot situation? No. Yeah, so very wide. Uh, okay. They're very wide uh, courses. Uh, they're mainly to prepare people to enter um, the animal care industry. Um, so uh, all of the learning about welfare laws, regulations, the basics of keeping, how to handle restraint and care for a lot of the basic species, not just exotics, you know, rabbits, guinea pigs, all the usual pets. Um, but it, or it did include some exotics, um, there's always an ex- exotics module on uh, these courses, um, which obviously I, I might have been a bit bored outside of that. Um, but also things like zoology, um, ecology. Um, so those courses prepare people to go into like pet shops, to zoos, to going uh, further on and going into um behavioral behavioral or um conservation so they can go anywhere with it essentially it's built for people to then go on to university and specialize where they feel they should right um and that's kind of our job is to prepare people to either walk into a generalized industry or go and find their niche gotcha um after that um and i found my niche but ended up staying where i studied so now, and now your role that. is is teaching the courses that you were t- being taught to yourself a few years ago. Is that right? Uh, kind of. So I'm not a lecturer, mm. um, a, a teacher forefront, uh, but teaching is definitely part of my role. So my official role is animal care technician, uh, meaning that I care for the animal collection day in, day out. Um, but that also means I'm there supporting students in practical sessions um, uh, and doing those sessions when they're actually working with the animals on the animal unit we have. Um, so outside of the students, uh, I also am basically the, that, that crazy herp guy that every, uh, shop, every pet shop or um, animal workplace has. They always have one guy that's obsessed with reptiles, insects, things like that. And I'm known for being that guy um, for our place. Mm. Um, and that means that luckily we have the freedom to take a section for ourselves, despite the fact we work with every animal we have in the collection. Um, so I also um, develop, plan um, any, any any new parts of the animal unit. So new species, enclosures, things we can teach for the students. Um, I'm able to input and, and change these things too. Um well, I, I want I want to learn a little more about the college collection, but first I want to jump back to one thing that you had yeah. said. Uh, you know, early on in your reptile keeping career, we'll call it, you said you were disappointed, and it seemed like you quickly realized that the actual welfare standards were pretty low across the board. And I think many people listening to this podcast, including myself, had a similar experience. So, do you remember? Was there something that triggered you to start thinking that way, or were you? Why did you come at it with this welfare mindset to begin with? Was that just part of the schooling, or do you, do you know? Um, a little bit. So during d- during the, the learning and the courses, uh, we'll learn about the basics of welfare and the, the science that sat underneath the welfare regulations and ideas we have now. And then when you look at those, so say basic needs of an animal – um the in the uk we have the five needs um if i if i took those and 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 took 10 different examples of hobby keeping that is put in front of us videos pictures um breeders and businesses i was finding that a vast majority of them were not even meeting basic welfare um, requirements. And this is for the UK's entire industry. Um, they, they were falling below as far as I was concerned. And what annoyed me was that people like myself at the time were learning from that, mm-hmm. were learning from that quality. And then not using that as a jump jump board to get better, but having it as the as the standard. Um, I'm not sure I can name any names, <laughs> but uh, yeah, a, a lot of quality, especially 
um, things on social media, big businesses showing how they keep animals yeah. as a business then rolling on to hobbyists and new people wanting to keep an animal and they will replicate what they see. People will always replicate what they see, especially with animals. Mm-hmm. Um, animal people, people do what they told when they, they first get an animal. And nine times out of 10, the first thing you come across online is not great. Yeah, no, it's so true. And, and there's also this it's as if the mindset to keeping isn't correct from from those big channels it, as far as this what we ought to have and i talk about it on the channel all the time is this mindset of growth and continuing to learn and and realizing mm-hmm. that your husbandry is never going to be static you're constantly going to have to evolve it doesn't mean that every day you're changing something maybe you have the same care for 12 16 months who knows it could be a long stretch where you you don't mm-hmm. have the time or the money to make a change but as you learn and you want to always be that sponge and, and when you can make a change make the change lar- larger enclosure change the lighting whatever it is and yeah there is something that happens with the, those large channels where it's this cookie, cut, cookie cutter method and there there isn't that concept of improving and, and continuing to learn it's just this is how you care for that animal and it's such a shame because it sets hobbyists up with the wrong mindset i think yeah and funnily enough i'm going to go off on a tangent on this Please. one uh so um i'm heavily involved in advancing herpetological husbandry ahh as, as many people know and one of the big things we've always been tarred with is is people saying that we say you have to do it this way you have to do it like this but the way the hobby is brought in by by being taught by these big businesses is actually more restricted than what we've always been trying to tell people. Like advancing has always been trying to give people options and try and teach new ways of thinking, not that you should keep like this, but you should think of all of these different things when you're setting up to keep an animal or thinking about getting an animal. And then you look at these, like you said, the, the, the quality of, um, people keeping on social media, you you only see very few standards. Mm-hmm. You see one, two, maybe three different ways of keeping and then the people trying to do better get tarred with being elitist and saying you only do certain ways when it's so far from the truth. It's painful. <laughs> yes. Well, it's the difference between calling it advanced herpetological husbandry and advancing mm. herpetological husbandry, right? I'm sure that was clearly yeah. an intentional cho- choice, right? Yeah. Um, people that have been uh, with advancing for a long time will know it actually started as advanced. Mm-hmm. Uh, and very early on, it, w- it was decided to change that for that exact reason. Yeah. Uh, that advanced will be seen as elitist, whereas advancing is intended to read as that we all advance together as an industry, as a hobby, as keepers. Um, and that, you know, ING, it's constant. Always exactly. advancing, always changing, always getting better. Um, and yeah, that, that was a pur- purposeful change. Yeah. So on that, I, I was brought on to uh, the Advancing Herb Husbandry team uh, quite early on, actually, while I was a pretty early student back on my level three. Um, somehow well, they would that have been? Crowd. Oh. Uh, so we started about 2012, so probably 20, late 2013, 2014, I might have got involved. Could even be 15. Um, and they took me on mainly as just a young guy that they saw online moaning at people. I was causing lots of arguments at the time in the hobby. Uh, absolutely, I was causing all sorts of trouble, um, getting angry at people, the way they were keeping um, their ideas around animal husbandry and behavior. Um, I caused a lot of trouble, but I also apparently used a lot of good words and was getting around certain people really well. And they took me on uh, to the admin team as... How did they word it? As a butt soother, I think was the official words. Um, <laughs> they wanted me on to help bring people round to the fold um, while some other members and admins were a lot more, you know, forceful and tough and, and potentially an annoying and, and pissing people off. Um, 
that's very much changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, but that's how I originally was brought on. Okay, interesting. Yeah, there's a it, there is a you have to strike a balance between that online communication when you're trying to give someone proper information. It's hard not to get mad, and we know that you know giving getting angry usually doesn't you know give you the right result, but. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. so let, let's jump back to the college collection. So if anyone's mm -hmm. watched, we'll get into the videos that you produced in, in, in a little bit. But on Herp HQ, you posted a preview of some of the educational series that, that are going to come up. And within that preview, you had all these amazing shots of incredible enclosures and species. So by the looks of it, that college collection is pretty wonderful. It's, it's not bad. <laughs> it, it's good. It has its limitations. Mm -hmm. And one of the first limitations to, to bring on before I start talking about how, how good it is, um, is that it's a teaching collection. It's not a zoo. It's not for looking at precisely. It's, uh, it's for students to get in hands on and work with. So some of our enclosures will seem basic because, for example, they might get full cleaned every couple of weeks. Mm. Um, which a hobbyist might not do with a reptile as such. And they're set up to allow for that. Um, but despite that, we try our best to um, bring welfare as high as we can, especially recently we've had a lot of big developments on our uh, herp side. Um, so we have, oh, where is it? Da -da -da. We have... 30, about 32 different species of reptile, uh, 21 species of amphibian, and over 20 handled species of invertebrate. Um, that's not counting feeders. I go with handled, uh, the ones that are there for education mm -hmm. rather than the masses of, of different feeders and cultures. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, how the college collection works, and you'll see a decent amount of the, the herp side on that video, like you said, the previews. Uh, where I'm playing about with with this exact camera. Um, so we have a dedicated reptile room, which has all of our lizards and our snakes. Uh, and then we have a separate uh, cooler room. Uh, we call it our amphibian room, but it holds all of our uh, invertebrates, uh, our amphibians, and a turtle pond that we've set up um, as a decent enclosure. Um, but one of my my big arguments when, when we went when I took over, not took over because I'm not the manager, but took over being able to develop parts of the herptile side is what's the point of teaching students if we're not showing them the higher part of quality? Mm -hmm. You will find with, with some colleges, and it's not necessarily their staff's faults, uh, an educational facility is, is um, they may go with what the exam boards, what, what's set for the courses to teach. They may go with the minimums, which may be keeping a snake, a frog, uh, a, a few rabbits and guinea pigs just to get the kids through the course. Mm -hmm. um, and what we want to do is forget about um, their, their course. We'll meet that. That's no worries. They'll get taught everything but we want them to be able to experience as many species as we can possibly get from different ecological niches, different behaviors, different looks, really pretty animals um, to try and draw them in and get them to find their interests and niches. Because as far as I'm concerned, there can be um, a conservation worker in any street. They just haven't seen the animal that, that that's, that's inspired them. And to have seen the husbandry to inspire them to keep well if they're going to. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, as soon as you come into the animal unit, that we have a little foyer space. Uh, the first two enclosures that you'll see are uh, Lamanctus, the cascade um, iguanas, and uh, Anthony's dart frogs in fully planted, really pretty, fantastically lit zoo style enclosures because that's what we pe want people to think when they first go in uh, before they then see some of the good. Everything has the space needs, but sometimes a bit naff looking stuff because it has to be. Um, but that's a great, 
learning space for students. I mean, if I was in a college that had a room like that, I would be absolutely obsessed with it. I mean, I've heard rumors of a of one snake on the campus that I work at. I've never seen it. Apparently, it's a Burmese python, and I've always wondered where it is or what it is. But if, if there was an actual, you know, small collection of animals, I, I would be there all the time. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and we surprisingly enough don't get as many students that are that enthused. I I think, but every year we get at least a couple students that are massively, massively enthused in reptiles. And I want to push them as far as I can. Any questions they've got, I'm, I'm there to, to push them forwards. Um, and we also like showing off the collection. Uh, some places are very um, closed off and don't want, don't want outsiders to see the collection and animals because they're just for the students. Mm-hmm. And maybe they're worried about the quality of the collection. You, we don't know. Um but we just want to show it off. We're always showing it off. If anyone wants to have a look around, um, we, we, we love to, to do that. Where, where would somebody go to, to see that? Is there an Instagram page or a Facebook page for that? Or uh, So that's something we might might well work on soon. We're not quite doing it yet. Uh, so the College Hale Zone College does have its own social media. Uh, and we, we get our, our, our animal care things posted on there quite a lot, actually. Um, okay. The marketing team really uh, gets their their worthwhile out of us <laughs> some nice pictures <laughs> as they yeah. should yeah yeah i'll make sure i have that in the show notes for people to go check out as well because i i, I can't, off the top of my head i can't really remember many of the species but you don't list you don't have to list through all of them because then we'll be here we could be here for a long time but yeah. maybe you could list just a couple of your favorite species that you're working with in that collection yeah, so we have a, a, a lot of the usual common ones, which we have to because if, if if students are going into the industry, the first thing they're going to come across is all of the common species, and they should work with them. Uh, but then we have uh, a lot of cool stuff. We've got in terms of snakes, um, Bredel's python, Bradley, uh, Grabowski's beauty snake, um, which is really really gorgeous, or Indonesian beauty snake, I think is another vernacular. Um, then onto lizards, uh, we have a few skinks, which is another a love of mine. Zebra skink, blue tongue. Uh, I'd say some of the more exciting stuff definitely comes out of our amphibians at the moment. Um, we've got the uh, nice golden mantellas, bumblebee toads. Uh, really excited with them. We're breeding the bumblebee toads at the moment. Um, we've got uh, tadpoles in a rain chamber, um, crowned tree frogs. Oh God, there's so much. It's tempting to get the um, record system on the screen and just show them off. Um, Chinese flying frog, that's huge and uh, brilliant. Um, we uh, we're on talks to get some really interesting animals as well. Pretty soon, we're going to get some um, pancake tortoises, which will be our first uh, conservation, uh, more important species. Um, at, with their own, huh? and the missus is trying to get me to mention a couscous, which isn't a reptile, but is still really cool. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. If, yeah, if if anyone knows a couscous, they're very adorable. Wait, is that a small mammal, mammal or? Uh, yeah, it's basically a uh, tropical uh, possum uh, okay. that we have our own uh, nocturnal room for. Um, he's brilliant. But back to the reptiles. <laughs> Um, yeah, and w- w- another thing that uh, we we like to push as a collection is having animals that the students won't handle, mm. which we we think is really important. The, a lot of students, and I know the hobby has a bit of a gripe with animal care students, um, and I th- I think some parts of it are very unfair. Um, because some students will go into an industry expecting, oh, we can handle and cuddle and, and love everything. Uh, but we've purposely stocked things like various species of dart frog so that they can't go in hands-on. They will work with the enclosure and the environment mm. uh, without ever having touched their animal purposely. Uh, other examples being we have a family of marmosets. That's our, um, our mammal example of something they'd never touch while working with. Um, and that's just so important. Um, as we go, I'll probably have more of our species. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's great. And I, I know you'd also told me that you do some 
uh, to help other colleges do some consulting with other colleges to help with their mm-hmm. collections. So what does that look like? Is that just other co- colleges with similar collections that are just looking for husbandry advice or? Yeah. So something we do at our workplace uh, already is we, we try to um, have a communication going with uh, other college collections across the country. So much like zoos work together uh, and swap animals without any money changing hands, depending on the the, the sources and collections. Uh, we also do that now with colleges and we have been kind of a, a, a place where that started. Um, we've also started doing conferences and workshops that are just for animal care technicians and college uh, workers to start learning from each other, developing more skills and showing off what they're doing because a lot of um, college projects and things don't actually get shouted about. Mm. Um, they happen internally and then get pushed into the past. Um, so we, we do a lot of that. The consulting work is, is so it's not official yet. I've just done a, a few bits just to help people, um, but I might be starting some proper consultant work uh, across colleges where I can help them develop their herptal collections in any which way they need, offer advice um, and training, offer CPD Um for them to get better in their own keeping and learn basically the more modern i the more modern ideas um and information because ultimately you can say you're trained and ready to take care of exotic animals but half half of what we learn is completely different officially a couple of years down the line exactly um and that information is constant always constantly changing i guarantee there are lots of species that the way we care for them right now will be completely different five ten years down the line yeah absolutely well and that's sort of speaks to the fluidity of of all of this right the fluidity of animal husbandry and keeping caring for biology in your own home Mm. right it's it's going to be a perpetual change and and no that that makes a lot of sense that's cool to see that you can actually influence other colleges as well I, yeah. I'd love to jump into the educational they seem willing, which is nice. What's that? And they seem willing, which is nice. Well, that yeah, that's um, that's key, right? Mm, mm. I'd love to jump into the educational series that you've just started on Herp HQ. So if I, many listeners will be familiar with Herp HQ because we've had Sam Parrott on in the past. He's got this the lighting genius doing all these crazy things as far as lighting <laughs> is concerned. And there's you guys have a really great channel. And I think many people don't realize that you're also kind of behind the scenes in that channel as well. And now you are stepping out in front of the scene, if that's a saying, and you actually have a few of your own videos on the channel. So maybe you could uh, give us a little bit of background on what motivated you to, to start the videos and, and what, what what sort of role did you have with with Sam's channel before or Herp HQ before? Was it just sort of an editing role or? Uh, no. So uh, more in the background of um, being a wall for him to throw ideas at. Gotcha. <laughs> Sam will, Sam will, uh, will back me up on that. He, he, it's nice to have some when you're doing such complicated stuff. And my God, it is complicated. I don't understand half of the, uh, the really deep lighting stuff he goes into. Mm-hmm. Um but a, a, a lot of the time I've just been there for him to throw ideas at and, and get them to make sense to a layman. If that, yes. if that makes sense in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and help him work ideas through just so someone to speak to. And we don't actually live far from each other at the moment. We live on the same estate. So a, a few minutes walk away so I can pop around, um, help chat things through, look at his enclosures and how, his current projects are going because the man always has about 10 different projects going at once, um, which is incredible. Um, And his recent times, his YouTube channel wasn't really being used. He was just putting the odd bits of project as he was naturally developing on there because it was interesting. Um, No real um, plan or outlook compared to the Facebook page, which definitely is more following the projects closer with more information. Um, And like I said uh, earlier, I wanted to use something like YouTube as a platform to, to get these ideas and teachings to a wider audience and to my, my own, uh, my own quality. I, I want things to be almost, Elitist is a bad word, mm. but I do want things to be put, the information to be put out there correctly, not half-heartedly. Um, 
and so I spoke to Sam and he said I could uh, use the YouTube account um, if I wanted because he trusted me to put some good information out there. He, he knew um, he knew the kind of information I use. He's been and seen the co- uh, college collection. In fact, we've had animals off him. Um, we've got um, Aki monitors um, that came from Sam um, when he, he reduced a bit of his collection to get it to the right uh, direction. Um but he, I don't think he had a proper idea of just what quality I wanted to get it to until I uploaded the first video. <laughs> was he pretty surprised? Um, I, I think he was, yeah. Uh, surprised and excited. Uh, did seem very excited. Um, it took me about two weeks to film and put together the first video, which was very day in, day out obsessive. Uh, I think that's how my videos go. I'll spend a, a good two flat days editing and editing until it's perfect. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a week or two of, of not doing anything, but look at the comments. <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how it worked with, with mine and Sam's uh, friendship and, and dealing with this. Uh, we both just want the industry to go forwards and Part of it is, is information and products need to be better. Yes, currently absolutely. Currently efficient um, to modern information. Well, with you and Sam working on HerpHQ, that's going to be an incredibly valuable channel for the hobby. I think it's going to be amazing between the, the mad scientist tinkering stuff that he's doing and all the DIY projects and, and these really powerful education videos that you're making. It's a perfect duo for, for a successful channel, I think. So I, I want to get into the two the two videos that you posted so far, but maybe mm-hmm. maybe first, just can you just quickly give people uh, just an idea, a rough, brief idea of what the type of videos you're making, You know what people can expect from you and maybe some topics that you plan on discussing um yeah so with the videos the last things are the last thing i want to do is list facts which is boring when it comes to such complicated um things as the topics i'm coming out with and just generally uh, you know herpetology herpetoculture how we keep our animals it's there's a million different topics in there that will go in crazy places and the only way is to do them properly is to collate a ridiculous amount of information because mm-hmm. guesswork is dangerous exactly so the last thing, like I said, the last thing I want to do is list facts, figures, and bore a person away from the actually good information. Because if they're bored away, they will go away and, and look at the first thing that comes up in, in the hobby industry, social media. Um, I don't want to tell people uh, that there are one or two ways that are correct, but I do want people to think. I want to open them up to concepts um, that the hobby and industry normally doesn't such as, you know, more accurate habitat data. Um, I want to take myths and fallacies and not just debunk them, not just say that they're wrong, but make viewers come to their own conclusions. Mm. Uh, I want them to understand why, why they're not true, why things could be better and better conclusions uh, conclusions themselves while we go on a herptile adventure. Um, if anyone is already a fan of YouTube creators like Vsauce and SciShow, I definitely take big inspiration from them. I've watched tons of their content, um, and I definitely get some style of teaching from that, um, both in the filming, how the information is presented, and how I'm writing the scripts as well, um, the way I'm trying to bring people in and keep them watching um, because it's interesting. Um, yeah, the videos are very story-ish. You know, they they have a, a flow, a really nice flow to them, and and they're, it yeah. is incredibly engaging. And I'm trying to think of what else it reminds me of. But yeah, they're very visual. It's not just you sitting in the camera. You have tons of B-roll that perfectly, you know, melds in with what you're saying. But there's this. You can tell it's scripted, but not scripted in a way that seems like you're reading off a chalkboard or anything. Yeah. It's it's scripted in a way where it it's like the dialogue is there, and it's incredibly engaging. And mm. I think you're right. We need to make videos like that to compete with the viral video of the person. You know, the video that's going to show up on someone's YouTube homepage that's reptile related. We know it's probably not going to have great content. So the only way to get us in there is by you know producing non boring content. 
Reptiles don't have emotions, right? Surely they react to just primal instincts, as long as they're eating, shedding and pooping, everything's fine. People saying this might not have known that they weren't right, but it's still harmfully untrue to say that reptiles don't have a conscious effect on the world around them. Stereotypically, people think that reptiles are primitive creatures. Some of this stems from the socio-zoological scale. This is a theory developed by Arnold R. Luke and Clinton Sanders in 1996. They stated that in the view of the generalised humanity, animals are scaled by a ranking of their place in our society, rather than as individually evolved species. They did this using four domains friends and tools, including animals that have companion use, such as cats, dogs, or beneficial use, such as horses, pigs, and cows. Then vermin and demons, including rodents, invertebrates, herptiles, and any animals considered dangerous or filthy. The basis of this is that we view animal mind complexity by their similarities to us. There are a multitude of things that affect this, such as personal experience, cultural and religious influence, what animals you spent time with at various ages, and how they were used. Dr. Ken Shapiro worded this well. We deny species their being through reference to animals based on their function from a human point of view. Pet animals, lab animals, farm animals. Animals at the top of this scale are viewed as more complex, more intelligent, more deserving of privileges not only directly, but in how we see their cognition, the way that we think they think. The issue here is that reptiles are viewed pretty low on this scale. They are seen as not intelligent, low and unevolved life forms. But having an evolutionary history that stretches back hundreds of millions of years does not imply simplicity. In fact, that gives these species their incredible range of forms, behaviours and intelligence. And, and one of the difficulties is, frankly, some of the worrying uh, social media outputs are actually really good at making videos that pull people in that are interesting and entertaining. That's what they're, they're good at. Really, really good at that job. Mm -hmm. Really fantastic at it. And until we're doing something similar, um, the industry probably isn't going to get better. Yes. Uh, we need to pit, pull in that interest uh, and become more interesting, more entertaining. Um, I don't know what I can do for the entertaining side for people that maybe don't want to uh, listen to a lot of information, but I can do it for some people. Um, I essentially want to uh, affect mindsets that are already potentially going to start going in the right direction. They just need to be shown. Um, the best sources of information that are currently out there. Yes, yeah. Um, and which I do, uh, if anybody watches the videos, and they do seem a little bit um, philosophical, um, I think they do come across uh, very, very much like that and a bit opinion-y. But um, if you have a look in the description of the videos, I do put a Google Drive um, access that anyone can look at as all of the sources of the information. So you can go on your own adventure um, to where all the information has been found uh, and influenced from. Um, so hopefully people are using those as well and not just taking my words for granted mm -hmm. um, as correct. Because, you know, um, like I said, with, with information, it changes. And some of my information might be wrong in a year or two. But at least um, you have the, is, the... frankly. Well, yeah, exactly. But even then, you still have the sources cited for how you built the 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 thesis of that video. So someone can go mm. back and go, yeah, some of this is incorrect now because we have these other studies, but you can see the studies that he was drawing off of to mm. make these conclusions. And it still fits within a perfect package. And, and in some cases, it's nice to go back and go, oh, this is why we were wrong. This is where the studies misled us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or sometimes a study will put us in the right direction, but not have the full story. Mm hmm and it takes another another study, another five studies to really uh, work that information to be be, be more accurate, exactly. uh, whether we've already applied that to our husbandry or not. Um, for example, lighting, uh, lighting and heating is a huge one at the moment. Um, the book on that is being re rewritten practically by the day. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that one's fun to teach about. Because, is is that a video that you have on the coming up at some point? I'm sure that uh, that's, there, that'll be an intimidating There definitely one. will. There definitely yeah. will be 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 ones touching on uh, lighting, heating, uh, between um, UV, UV, ambient lighting, which is going to be a really important one for people to start thinking about because it's very very um, misunderstood and not used correctly. Mm-hmm. Where people just throw like an LED on an enclosure, but that is far too much to uh, put into a small chat. It needs to be in a hopefully a digestible um video like i've already done yeah well <laughs> so, why don't we talk about the the ones the two that you've already made the, the first one was i think the first one was the reptile emotions one yes and uh, yeah. yeah it was brilliant and so i'd love to break that one down a little bit more and give people a sense of what you discussed and then encourage them to go actually check out the full video yeah. but uh, can you give us just a little brief summary of, of what that video was investigating yeah so that's that video stems from my frustration on how people treat reptiles, how people treat animals that they naturally, whether they actively think it, but naturally see as, as lower than lower than themselves, as more primitive, primordial animals, and thus people will see them as simple, unable to do more than uh, look for food, breed and basic or or autonomous functions. Um, The video, I wanted it to be a way to really point out that if I was to sit there and say that that snake is thinking, working things out, potentially has uh, basic emotions, I want to put data to that. Mm. I want... I want it to be backed up and not just be an opinion that somebody can walk away and say, snakes don't think, you know, they just, they just slither around and eat things and, and, and hiss and do all that. Um, so I was, I wanted to, it's very philosophical, sure, again, but I wanted to go into things like and the anatomy of it, uh, actual uh, behavioral studies that are published and accepted and peer reviewed and have been used already as, as jumping boards to go on to even more crazy behavioral studies on these animals. So um, I wanted to go into how things like snakes are able to learn, learn really complex behaviors, uh, both in the wild and captivity uh, and emotions. What are emotions? So I discuss that. Um, I discuss how people view these animals as wrong. So there's the triune triune brain was the old one, the three uh, the, the three parted brain. So you've got the inner reptile brain, then the limbic brain, and the neocortex. Uh, and people stereotypically, previously, it's I'll go into it in the video uh, specifically who. Um, said that the internal, the, the, the deeper parts are simple and called it the reptile brain. Mm-hmm. Now, while science didn't accept that, even at the time science debunked it, said that that's ridiculous, um, all of this information says otherwise, the populace um, grasped it and, and took it for granted. And, and, and up until now, that's still been the way people are, are taught. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, people learn more from their own cultures, their own people, than um, educational sources. Absolutely. Do you know what what year that that triune brain model was established? Around was it like the fifties or the sixties? Or uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the fifties. I've the, I've got too much in my brain at the moment. Oh yeah, no, no, just a rough <laughs> idea is, is is good. Like so, so what's yeah, called 50, the fifties. Uh, yeah, yeah. And if you check you, out, if people want to check out the video, the date, um, sorry, the years that the different concepts are on there. Well, and um, the so that was you know seventy years ago or whatever, and yeah, you still I, you hear people all over the place, people that know nothing about animals. Yeah. They use the term lizard brain or reptile brain, brain all reptile the time. Brain. Yeah, yeah, and you'll see it put on uh, Facebook pictures. People share um, about uh, oh, you have you unlocked your full reptile brain uh, or like everything past that You're using the full amount of your brain, um, and it's 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 damaging. It's entirely damaging on how we see these animals because if you instantly, from before you enter the complex parts of husbandry, if you instantly think they're simple, then look at the animal in its enclosure, you're going to continue thinking it's simple because they're not like us. 
and humans instinctively don't like to give complex concepts to things that aren't like us. It's very easy for us to say that apes are complex, have emotions. Uh, it's very easy to say that you know dogs and cats have complex emotions, attachments, and behaviors, and, and, and are able to learn. Um, but if you look into the biology, which I go into in the video, um, a bird brain looks very, very similar to a reptile brain. Very similar. Um, and the structures are very similar. Ultimately, look at that comparison. It's easy to say that parrots and birds, or not even parrots, uh, simpler birds, uh, are extremely intelligent, emotional, able to learn a ridiculous amount of, of, of things. Um, but why then do we say that reptiles can't? Mm -hmm. Their faces and head and body are completely different to us, so we don't want to imagine them as being able to do these things. Yes. Uh, some people even find it offensive, straight up offensive, because humans are considered the, the best, the top of the, the animal hierarchy, the animal kingdom, or not even as animals, something above that, um, which of course comes into the socio-zoological scale, which uh, I talk about in the video as well. Um, some of these things are going to be very simplified. If you go into actually study these things, oh my God, you go really deep, mm -hmm. really deep into, into things like socio-zoological scale and human-animal interactions, um, which again is something that offends me is that I teach, I might teach these things day in, day out. My coworkers will teach these things to students day in, day out. And the exam board say that we need to teach these things because they are the correct scientific, currently true information and have been for years and hobbyists are all over the place saying that it's absolutely false and stupid and, and not worth thinking about. Why would we be teaching these things if yeah. that was the case? Well, and I think you kind of alluded to something there is as soon as you start to unravel and unweave reptile intelligence and start to actually get it at the root, you, you, you basically hit a roadblock of human psychology, like you, like you kind of alluded to there. It's just immediately, we, we, a lot of people don't want to confront that fact that maybe these animals are smarter than we think. We actually are bad at recognizing intelligence in other animals. And it, much, it's just, yeah. and then how we interact with that animal plays a huge role in, in how, how intelligent we think they are. Like cats and dogs seem smarter, they interact with us. And something that I've always said, and, and you actually mentioned in your videos, that snakes are even one level lower than lizards as far as most people are concerned mm. as intelligent goes. And mm. I always think it's because, and you may have even said this, but I've said in the past that because they don't have arms or legs, they do not manipulate the environment in the same way that other things we're used to. So we look at it as just like a worm and even if there is an intelligent ability to problem solve, and, and we know that's true in these animals, just because they don't have the ability to manipulate the environment in the same way that a bird could or, or a mammal or even a lizard, we mm. immediately rank them really, really low on the intelligence scale. And it's important there to focus on how you worded it the same way. To, to be able to manipulate the environment in the same way. We take these hands and these fingers for granted, and we love it when other animals try and use their limbs like hands and fingers. God, we obsess about it. If an, if an animal looks like it has an opposable thumb, it's the next uh, social media uh, extravaganza. Um, but snakes are able to manipulate their environment just like lizards do. And like you say, uh, you know, snakes are more modern biological evolutionary creations um, compared to lizards. Lizards eventually, uh, evolutionarily lost their legs and became snakes. Mm -hmm. That's massively simplified, but that's how it went. Uh, but people like to view snakes as older and, and, and less evolved. But by time, it's the opposite. Right. Uh, and like I said, snakes can manipulate their environment. They're a species of snake that will sit in their environment, uh, view what's around them, and move plants and objects so that they can create a better ambush position. There are studies showing that. Yes. So they can they can manipulate their environment actively. Just because your snake in your vivarium doesn't do it, maybe it's because we're constantly moving the things in our vivarium around. 
Mm-hmm. They're not having a chance to do that or a reason to do that because we set them up uh, as best as we can for them perfectly. When the world environment they come from um, is very rarely perfectly set up for them. So or nothing's they try movable in their viv, right? <laughs> you know, a lot yeah. of times we have everything fixed and there's a heavy water yeah, dish and the branches in. are fixed in, the plants are planted, like the snake can't move anything. Mm. Uh, also, um, then there's the thing on uh, live and fake plants. Mm. Um, there have been studies that have figured out that there, uh, some species of snake actually prefer not only not only prefer live plants to fake plants, and there is already a study out there that's showing that um, fake plants actually reduce welfare compared to compared to real plants to live plants. Um, they also have preferences on what species of plant they want to sit on, mm. not just because it works better for say advantageous for them getting prey they have preference if you give them the choice of one or the other they will sit on one or the other the studies have already been done on the wild animals uh, themselves not just the captive ones and we should actually for a lot of these studies focus on the wild ones where we can mm-hmm. because i this the work has not been done yet but i am convinced a lot of our captive animals are developmentally stunted um in in the in their in their thinking ability because many uh people think that because they are not precocial they 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 rep, reptiles are born hatched and are straight to surviving people think that the brain is already fully formed and everything they know is already there um the truth is very much that they have a massive amount of learnt behaviors uh, and learnt things and there's something to think about with intelligence uh, called uh, brain plasticity. Mm-hmm. Um, the ability for a brain to, to, to develop new connections and, and new, new ways of thinking, new learned behaviors. And brain plasticity is most when an animal is young. An animal is, is, is either a baby or an adolescent and growing and doing things, exploring, manipulating their environment. And what what is one of the most common ways of keeping a neonate snake, for example, in in our hobby, in our yeah. industry? Bear tub. A bear tub. Um, and that's not only in, in all of the worst examples. There are lots of brilliant people, absolutely brilliant people that I love and am inspired by still do that. Uh, it's it's still very much a, a, a standard to put a neonate in a bear tub until it is big enough to fully use um, a complex, awesome environment, a big vivarium that now it looks pretty and it's using it all. But if that animal started in uh, a bear tub, was unable to learn, unable to manipulate it for its environment, its, blame, its brain plasticity has been potentially wasted right again like i said there's no studies on this actually i think there might be something on that i'll come back to you on that (laughs) um but their plasticity has been wasted and thus the adult captive animal may not be able to learn as well as as a wild individual or one that has has lived an enriched life since the start Mm-hmm. Um, well, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, that that is in in many ways, it's pretty intuitive to think that, and and you know, quite often we have this negative feedback loop of of keeping an, an animal in a plain tub, and and then you know, a lot of the industry continues to keep them in a in a relatively plain tub, and then they look at the animal that spent a decade or eight years in a tub and, and say, hey, this animal can't solve problems it's, it's relatively unsophisticated oh, yeah yep. but it's a stupid animal it's a dumb animal exactly yeah so this friendly. animal it hasn't had the chance to learn or problem solve although they'll still say like hey be careful opening the tub because every time i do that it'll give a feeding response so it has some learned behavior that they're not making the connection but for the most yeah. part the animals had no opportunity to grow the, the animal is dumb because you've made it dumb Exactly. Using dumb very carefully as a word, uh, not the, the connotations around that I absolutely don't intend, but uh, bluntly, that animal is, it's it's hard, even harder to see that animal as intelligent because you've not allowed it to become a smarter animal. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and you, it's, the more you think about it, the more you wonder how much of that is self-imposed in a way 
where there's a lot of people kind of getting back to the human psychology side, how many keepers don't want to know how smart snakes could be, the potential could be? Because then mm. you run into mm. a big ethical problem when you have a wall of 200 snakes in a plain tub, and then you think, yeah. oh my gosh, I've just eliminated the opportunity for these animals to thrive and potentially forever because of the conditions they've been in. Yeah, yeah. People people always think, uh, you know, it will be temporarily like this. It, it's only like this for a bit. Um but the way you keep that animal temporarily may affect the rest of its life. Uh, and, and and back onto, you know, early development affecting them, we already know it works in people. Mm-hmm. We already know um, a bad start in life where you don't get to experience much. Um, I don't, I, it's kind of upsetting to go into certain examples, but um, there's, uh, there's Jeannie, the uh, wild child, was a classic psychological uh, example of a human child that was um, not able to live stimulated and became, you know, someone be- became someone in their mid to late teens with the brain of a, a, a toddler, mm-hmm. essentially. Right. And while people might hear this and say, that's nice, that's interesting information, but we're talking about animals there is no reason I can't talk about both of them at the same time. Anthropomorphism has been taken way out of context nowadays by a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Anthropomorphism is, is, is seeing an animal, uh, applying human qualities to an animal. But what if that animal already had similar qualities that it developed itself evolutionarily? Mm-hmm. Um what if they already have complex emotions? We can't suddenly treat them as robots because we think it's suddenly wrong to compare them to us. We're animals. We're part of this evolutionary long, long, long chain, um, and and we should we should treat ourselves as that and the animals uh, to have similar possibilities. Uh, we already know that that exact example of of a you know a person having a bad start and ending up uh, stunted in many ways as uh, neurologically psychologically physically happens across pretty much all taxa i know that have been looked at happens with birds happens with reptiles happens with, with mammals um and we have to also understand people assume that because technology and information is so well developed now that we already know everything mm-hmm. by god we don't we're just we don't started. know anything. We don't know anything. We're getting started J- just because you know technology is amazing. I'm able to sit here in front of a camera and speak to you about these complex things that we already know what animals are capable of. Uh, we we have no idea what animals are capable of. Um, new studies that come out about you know how really interestingly behavioral uh, behavior things from snakes. Uh, well, that same study could be done on amphibians. It hasn't yet. Yes. The same thing could be done on a hundred, a thousand different species and find different things, yes. find new yes. things. Um, and we need to stop presuming anything, really. Well, the hist- like, what's the history of biological sciences in general? The history of doing proper scientific studies on bio- biological beings can't be more than a hundred years old, maybe a hundred, I, I, oh, I don't yeah. know, maybe 150 years old at the most, which is just a little microsecond as far as, uh, you know, what, what there is to learn. So we are really just getting started. And, and as you're talking there, sort yeah. of talking about the early de- de- developmental years, we know how the, important they are for mammals and, and, and humans, obviously. And, and we classify that a lot of the time as play, how important play is. And you can see mm. uh, young animals play, and it's so crucial for them to learn their environment and learn what hurts and learn and learn what they can do and, and how their bodies work and how to hunt and, and certain things like that. And you can only imagine that reptiles also engage in some form of play that we're not recognizing. Now, we always, you know, play is a happy, fun time, and so that would be anthi- anth- anthropomorphizing, but it's not. It's a, it's no. a point in time for them to learn and, and experience the world, and yeah. we may not recognize it, but surely it's happening. Yeah, so something I haven't touched on properly. I touched on it a little bit when in the video I talk about something called uh, cratalomorphism by omission. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I love really discuss example. it much, but uh, it's it's directly ripped from research and, and, and talks that have already been done. Um, we always talk about anthropom- anthropomorphism as a bad thing we shouldn't do. 
Um, if that's the case, then why is critical anthropomorphism used across research as a positive thing? Uh, critical anthropomorphism is basically where uh, it's been, as long as we are able to contextualize the information we, we, we bring about for it and use it properly with uh, data and such, it can be beneficial for us to imagine ourselves as an animal, as the animal we're thinking of and talking about. Imagine yourself as that snake, not with a human mind. Imagine yourself as that snake with the snake's body, the snake's thoughts, the snake's experiences from young up until its point, as far as you can, and use that to guide how you think about that animal's life about its behavior, its welfare, its experiences, potentially its biology, uh, and definitely, especially its psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, uh, there, there are some brilliant studies out there about not only actually doing that with animals, but just how to think like that. Um, some of the old stuff uh, um, talks about things like, uh, it's the Umwelt, it's a German word for inner self, um, where you look at and try and imagine yourself as the animal and then use that actually to write up a scientific uh, scientific hypothesis now if 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 anthropomorphism was entirely bad and we shouldn't uh, you know anthropomorphize our animals why is it used in science to 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 create new topics right why is comparative anatomy uh, why is comparative neuroanatomy a thing where we compare the human brain to an animal's brain? Mm -hmm. um, don't get me wrong. There are parts of anthropomorphism that are horrifically dangerous and bad and we shouldn't be doing it or like um, the standard geek keepers uh, and people shouldn't be doing it um, because it could lead to them treating their animals completely wrong. But, by taking that too far, we're completely missing out on a massive amount of really interesting information and ways of thinking about our animals. In many um, ways, those two things are just completely separate. You know, what you're talking about, that critical anthropology or critical anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism you know, yeah. compared to, you know, the putting uh, clothes on your bearded dragon and, and giving it a <laughs> shower with shampoo or, you know, yeah. those sort of things that we see as anthropomorphism, no. that, that, that's not anthropomorphism. I don't know what that is. It's something else. It's more of like an egotistical driven thing that people want the animal to be something that it's not. It's just wrong compared so, to thinking about it in the way that you are. Yeah. So critical anthropomorphism where you're putting yourself in the animal seat is more, um, sure, use an emotional response, but contextualize it to the animal. So uh, you're a lizard. You have uh, you have a negative experience, maybe maybe an experience with a predator. Um, do you actually find on the spreadsheet how you're meant to react as a robot, as as a, as a predetermined code? Um, no, you'll have an a, a, a emotional response that could that could lead to a range of different behaviours depending on the the individual it's learned behaviors it's uh it's emotional mental state um the individual situation um masses masses amount of different contextualized information that you can only really consider if you've imagined yourself as the animal yes yeah, it's so true. And and you run through a, a really interesting example in the video. So I'll leave that for the video for people to go watch because it, it really frames it in a way that completely makes sense. And, and you know, putting yourself in the in the eyes or the, you know, the embodying a snake in a way, which was, was really cool. So yeah, that that is a fascinating topic. And, and like I said, the video has a lot more of, of the nitty gritty details. And I'm sure there's many more videos of the on of that topic to come because it really is endless at this point. And and mm. the the next video that you did was to do with leopard geckos. Jumping mm. to the next topic here, leopard geckos <laughs> as far as where they where they live and and it's funny we have these common species that we keep in the hobby and quite often the way that the care sheet tells people how to care for them is, is so wrong. And, and I, I've likened it to on a 
previous episode, like this, the, the game telephone. I don't know. You have that game telephone in the UK where you have kids and you sit them in a circle and you give one like a sentence, uh, whatever yes. the sentence is, and then they tell it yeah. to each other. And by the end, it gets to the end of the circle. It's something completely different. And, and yeah. almost that's how t- that, that this care of a common species like a leopard gecko has happened. You know, you have generations of people who have been caring for them. And slowly over time, you know, people have been adding their own thing to it. And now it's just sand and a cactus and no water and we're good to go so you really kind of dissect this in that video so maybe you could tell us a little bit about that one yeah so wow that's a big topic and it definitely came uh, out of a completely different direction for the um, uh, reptile emotions video mm-hmm. um but i needed to target a commonly kept animal one to bring the viewers in if i'm being blunt um but how many people actually go and, and, and experience an animal's wild habitat before they keep it? None. Very, very, <laughs> yeah. very few to none. Uh, yeah. At most is people that obs- get obsessed with, with herping uh, and go out and do that stuff. Um, but oftentimes, even then, they've kept the animal uh, before they've gone and seen it in the wild. Um, and on care sheets and information that's currently existing in the hobby, I think we need to contextualize how a lot of that information developed over over the years. Uh, let's take the leopard geckos in the video, for example. Initially, when they first uh, came into herbet culture early on, really early on, what will have happened is not a few of them came in uh, and somebody started, you know, keeping and breeding them. That's not how 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 these things tend to happen. If that happens, it's very lucky. How it actually happens is thousands of these animals get exported from their their wild environment, their wild mm-hmm. their, uh, source country. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them will enter the industry, the hobby, and they will be, then be distributed between innumerable people. Uh, and that happened with leopard geckos. Tons and tons of them came in, um, and it's the uh, it's the lucky survivors that succeeded. It was trial and error. And care sheets still reflect early trial and error, which is unfortunate. They reflect on the first things that people assumed is why the gecko that in front of them has survived longer than the hundred others they tried with mm-hmm. or that came into the wholesalers and, and didn't um, succeed in thriving and died instead. Uh, and there's the problem. We shouldn't be we, we, we shouldn't be applying this this information that came just from accidents, from accidental survivors, from the hardy few lizards that came in and were at, were able to thrive because they are hardy, hardy individuals or hardy species. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that's the information we see. That's where we get the temperature numbers on care sheets. You know, keep them at so and so degrees is because they kept the lizards at various different temperatures and found that those ones survived, yeah, or are actually managed to thrive. Um, same with humidity, same with light cycles, same with uh, diets. I don't think we 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 give credit to how many animals um, in the past, at least, and sometimes currently. Um, will 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 die just because people are trying to figure out how they need to keep those animals alive. Yeah, and I I need to be careful with what I'm saying because sometimes that sounds very animal rights. It's mm-hmm. not. It's just true. That's that's how these things happen. Um, and believe me, I just want to see the industry and and hobby thrive. I want to see these animals thrive. But until we do that, we need to be able to see and admit how these keeping methods and how these animals first initially came into the industry. Yeah. So hardy animals get the worst hand in her pet culture. Is the blunt way of saying it. Um, at least this is going to be blunt again. At least the more sensitive niche animals will just die mm-hmm. and die fairly quickly. The hardy generalists, so animals that live in an environment where they are able in the wild to survive a massive range of of, uh, conditions, a massive range of temperatures, seasonal changes, um, diet restrictions and such throughout their ranges and and times, 
those are the ones that are able to come into captivity and carry on doing the same surviving in the uh, potentially not great ways we're keeping them which isn't always our fault we don't know it is trial and error mm -hmm. but those successes can't be chalked up as correct a lot of them are accidental mm -hmm. accidental lucky um and, and, it, and it's sad especially when it still happens nowadays when we have access to so much more information than the original keepers did yes um so those hardy animals will survive through improper husbandry for far far longer um they will survive for as long as what might seem a full life um but i would like to remind people that for most species Despite the fact, despite the fact there might be thousands of them in captivity, uh, we don't fully understand their longevity. We don't know how long they're meant to live biologically. Yeah. Um, sure, it might be longer than the wild, but that's incomparable. You can't compare the two like that. Um, we don't know how long they're they're biologically able to live. So we can't say that an animal living ten years, a lizard living ten years, is okay. When if in 10 or 20 years we find out how we're meant to really keep them condition wise and suddenly they live 20 30 40 years mm -hmm. yes maybe longer there are snakes from fantastic keepers that have been doing a lot of this revolutionary stuff for decades and just haven't been talking about it or haven't been uh, exposed to everyone about it um that do have snakes for example that are 30 40 years old yeah. um you don't often see that in, I'm going to be blunt again, in racked animals. Right. Um, because then you end up with the masses of, of things like uh, obesity, um, uh, skeletal uh, muscular problems that will shorten lifespan. Mm -hmm. And you won't see it on those animals. Um, most, most health conditions that affect these animals don't show like metabolic bone disease does which everyone knows metabolic bone disease because it's one that shows very obviously. Yes. The suffering is obvious. But most health conditions don't show like that. And these animals won't show us that they're in pain or suffering or not okay. Because if they did that in the wild, they would die even sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd be picked off by predators. Um, they would show weakness. They don't naturally do that. Um, so... When it comes to the leopard geckos one, they've always been touted as desert animals, as arid, which, I mean, it's a, it's a fair assumption if you look at one. Uh, their coloration looks deserty, especially the original, um, the original ones where we're not talking about morphs, mm -hmm. uh, which you won't catch me talking very much about morphs. Um, <laughs> I'm just not interested in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, Where's the information about the original ones that were caught up in the wild and then sold into the hobby? Um, nowhere. Again, the animals came in and guesswork so, uh, got some of them to survive. What we need is people actually out there on foot getting habitat conditions. Mm -hmm. And the video goes into uh, a few of the studies that have shown where these animals have been found. Really surprising places, really surprising conditions as well. Um, both by temperatures, the amount of moisture. Um, I mean, who would stereotypically imagine leopard gecko and monsoon being discovered, um, being discussed in the same sentence? Right. Um, but they, they absolutely uh, do experience things like monsoons. Um, and one of those people uh, is Ben Owens over at Captive and Field Herpetology. I uh, shout out massively on the video. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2018 was the first one or 2019. Um, he went out to India, found some leopard geckos, thought that was brilliant, especially where he found them. Um, before he, he spoke about it, he went and confirmed the species um, for DNA work that they are the exact ones that we keep in captivity. Same species, same line uh, of the ones that were uh, originally captured and, and, and imported to, to us. Um, and they're in wet woodland, mossy, wet, 
cool woodland. Yeah. Lush, lots of plants. Um, sure, sand and rock is there, but you know the the way they're living is nowhere near how we're keeping them in captivity. They're living in rock wall, in 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 rock wall tunnels and coming out and exploring and and and, and trying to catch all sorts of food on various substrates. Even up in 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 dead trees, they've been found in hollows of dead trees. Um, in in places that will get flooded with moisture mm, mm-hmm. um and i'll go into a lot of the uh the, the specifics in the video don't i um uh trying to compile the these different uh, aspects of the wild environment that we know of now mm-hmm. but what that video shows is what we don't know exactly just because i've compiled that and that information from brilliant people that have gone out there and found those animals uh, and tried to get habitat data, specific stuff. Like Ben goes out there with a solar meter uh, and such to to actually find out what that, that habitat data is. I still wouldn't say we know enough about the leopard gecko to be able to recreate its wild environment. Which is so shocking to say, considering how popular of an animal it is, how, how often it's kept, and how long we've been keeping it in captivity. But it, it's amazing you think... This is a popular species. They got to be running around everywhere in the wild. And if you go to Google Images and search "wild leopard gecko," you get like three pictures. Mm. <laughs> and you th- and so, you know, like so Ben has done some work, and a few researchers have done work. But it's not. Or you can maybe go to iNaturalist. But it's just mm. there's not a lot out there, which is really strange. <laughs> it's, the, it's the same for a lot of common stuff. Right. Um, ball pythons, as you shall know them out there, regis. They uh, guards try and find wild habitat data on them. Mm-hmm despite the fact how many millions of them are in captivity. It's amazing. Uh, incredibly difficult. There are a few brilliant sources of information and individuals to get their uh, own experiences. Uh, and funnily enough, some of the only scientific sources of information absolutely rewrite the book on how they're kept. Um, right. it, it Actually, it's upsetting when you read it and then look at how they're kept in captivity. Um but we we don't know, and what that what that really emphasises is not that there are certain ways of keeping these animals. Again, going back to advancing herb husbandry being tarred as that you have to do things in certain ways. God no! From the information we're finding, uh, what we want is to give the animals choice, mm-hmm. give the animals choice of conditions rather than a static enclosure with uh, you know this temperature on the one side, this temperature on the other. Um, and a rock here and this light exactly here. How about we we start keeping in larger enclosures, much larger, where we can provide one very, well, this is an example just for leopard geckos, but one very, very warm area, then tunnels that get various temperatures and humidities. And then as the enclosure goes, it gets darker and darker and cooler and cooler. Essentially, I'd like an enclosure to be peak temperature on one side and then a, a couple meters away, um, cooler than a hobbyist would usually let their, let their reptile get. Mm-hmm. Um, people, God, God, people are so afraid of the cold. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Seriously afraid of the cold for their reptiles, and it, it blows my mind. Um, and they don't realize how cold it gets in the wild sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. Just as a random example. Um, yeah, choice, gradients, both for temperature, humidity, um, UV, ambient lighting, um, all of it should be a gradient to give them the choice. Mm-hmm. And as we go back to the learnt behaviours and brain plasticity, if you start an animal like that, watch its behaviours, watch it learn where to go at certain points of day in your specific enclosure, just like they would in the wild. Um, They will learn where their favorite places are. They will learn if they're not, uh, if if they're coming up to a shed, that there is a certain tunnel that gets us to a certain humidity that they will go and lie in. Um, Whereas if we're keeping in classic uh, hobby methods, 
Uh, going back to Tubbs, the classic example. Again, I'm not. Uh, I'm not arguing Tubbs are bad. That whole thing, Tubbs can be done right, but who is actually doing that? I know probably like three people. Yeah. In, in the hobby wide that might be keeping well in Tubbs. Um, so let's all be honest and admit that a lot of racks and tubs really aren't being used well. And yes. given an animal one temperature, one humidity, one light level, and saying it's correct when we frankly do not know what correct is. Yeah. Well, and I think you hit the nail on the head and you took the words right out of my mouth is enclosure size. And I think if that is something that needs to be greatly increased, like even for myself, like now I've just in the last couple of months, I've just really become aware of how small enclosures are. And now when I look at my enclosures, I don't see a beautiful, well-planted enclosure. I see a small box and it's mm. kind of sad. And you just see the walls for some reason. I'm not sure what happened with my perspective shift, but suddenly I just see walls and I, I really desperately want to change this. And I, and I, and I will over time. And I want to see that in the hobby as well. You could probably have massive enclosures for small species and it would just be so much better and and you, what, what i like about that is you should admit that mm -hmm. you should discuss that you should say what you just said yeah and not not feel like you're being pressured by people like myself mm -hmm. that's not that's not my aim i don't want you to feel bad about your husbandry exactly i want you to look at your husbandry and go i can do better and i will do better mm -hmm. when i'm able to but ideally when you can um this this isn't to bash on people it's to make sure that animals are kept the best we can not correctly correctly i guess is the wrong word and is misleading as best as we currently can is maybe a better way of saying it yes and the the ma magic with that is as you walk that path the enjoyment of caring for the animal increases at the same rate, oh, yeah. almost. As you increase your level of care, your enjoyment will increase. The, mm. the amount that you see from the animal increases. So it is a very much a positive feedback loop. And and mm -hmm. so as soon as you go down that path, it's easy to continue when you have the money to do so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Money is a constant problem. Like, don't get me wrong. We have it. Yeah. Even in workplaces and co colleges and collections and zoos, they all have the money problems. And that's totally fine. You can go ahead and admit that. Um, you shouldn't be torn apart for that. Um, but it's the intention, the intention to do better, the intention to provide more, and the intention to continue learning and think, think about your pet properly, think about your animals properly. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm using round words with correctly and properly, uh, but I think we get what I'm trying to say. Um, it's going in the right direction. Exactly. And I'm hoping with my videos, I will eventually touch on all the hundreds of different topics that can be improved you know enrichment more on um learning and behavior uh one thing i really want to touch on is reptiles ability to do uh spatial mapping mm. where they're able to you know map the enclosure or enclosure's bad word the space around them and commit it to memory and even um uh, think about what they're going to do next. Maybe think about what they're going to do if they have a panic situation. They know exactly where they need to go mm -hmm. rather than robotically just going in a direction. Right. Um, they have territories. Uh, yeah, things like enrichment as well. Um, and all sorts. There's so many topics. I've got a long list of topics that are potentials. And I also really want to hear more ideas of other people. If, if if you think that there's a, a topic that needs to be covered, maybe because you think, feel like you don't know enough about it, or maybe you specifically know a ton about it and feel like no one else does, I'd love to put videos out on stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Go to the Herp HQ channel, comment on the videos, <laughs> and you'll see them. Let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I can speak for everybody and say that we're all very excited to see those videos continue to pop out because the first two were incredible, and uh, I, I cannot wait to see what you else have or what what you have in store as, as we move forward. So, why don't we wrap up the conversation with the the conference coming up this weekend? Well, it's this weekend for us, for the listeners, it will already be a weekend ago or more. So, if you're <laughs> listening to this now, you already missed your shot at it. But but there's always more attempting to get back to a yearly or annual conference. I'm sure with the advancing herpetological husbandry, COVID yep. has thrown wrenches into things clearly but maybe yeah. you could just give people uh what is in store for this weekend 
Oh my God. Uh, many big names. Um, lots of talks. So we've got two days of, of talks, some big names. We've got people coming from the U S from, uh, Germany, uh, Australia just come and talk. Uh, so in terms of each of them, so in the U S we've got Robert Mendike, which is a brilliant, uh, um, researcher and, and zookeeper, um, who has some amazing work done on reptile welfare and basically like a sliding scale of, uh, what's basic and how we constantly go up and up and up and up and don't stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have uh, DGHT, which is essentially the the, the German um, Herpetological Society over there. Uh, we've got a few uh, members of those coming over to speak about uh, various reptiles and things. Uh, we've got the Beardy Vet coming from Australia. A lot of people have heard of, of him going out and actually looking at Bearded Dragon environments. He's coming over specifically to talk, which is very, very nice when really some of these people could um, ask to do these things remotely. Right, but they're yeah. flying thousands of miles <laughs> to come and actually talk to us about it. Talk to uh, attendees, and we are looking uh, at quite a good footfall, well over a hundred people, um, which is really, really good for a conference. Mm-hmm. Um, we're having uh, quite a few. Different- so we we usually uh, the conferences have have people like Francis Baines and Roman Murrin talk on their lighting and and heating and we will uh, we've also got Francis Kaskiri talking about coach whips about mm-hmm. snakes uh, we've got a few things about uh, monitors um, we've got Marco Shea on the lunchtime tour a uh, dinner talk on the evening of the Saturday. Um, I'm very all over the place explaining this. I haven't prepared anything. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That's good. I mean, it sounds very fluid to um, me. I mean, I think you're making everybody jealous listening to this. Yeah. Uh, a few, uh, quite a few zoo personalities. Um, Gerardo Garcia, for, who's the um, curator of um, lower vertebrates, I, I believe. Um, lower vertebrates and invertebrates at Chester Zoo, which is a very highly renowned zoo here in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, some really big names, really big topics, and hopefully not only from the talks, a really good social. Yes, um, well, that's the thing that we've missed for the past two years, right? Connecting yeah. with people in person and other keepers, especially, you know, I think the last time COVID was not a thing, there was two conferences, right? One in the UK, one in, in New Mexico. Yeah. And so it's a great p- time for people to connect, and now there just hasn't been anything. So it'll be good to have people in person. Mm. Mm. And hopefully we'll do more interesting conferences. Where we, uh, I, I, can't speak of what we can or will do, but it would be really nice to go out and do another US one. The one in New Mexico at the Chiricahua Desert Museum was incredible. I was really happy with that adventure. Uh, funnily enough, me and Sam uh, both went out and made a two-week adventure out of that, um, herping around California, Arizona, New Mexico. Um, and that was brilliant. Massive, brilliant stories came from that. <laughs> Definitely oh, solidified our uh, our friendship and work with H- uh, Herp HQ. Um, and, and that's what's brilliant. Brilliant, the social side where people can come together, share great information, uh, not be offended at each other like they are on Facebook and, and other social medias where we start discussing you know, complicated topics and then people feel offended because maybe it looks like we're saying that your husbandry isn't very good. But how about we come together and discuss on how we can make that better and, and smile at the end of it? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's the aim with, you know, doing things in person. Not just celebrating, but say uh, being able to admit to each other when things aren't good enough mm-hmm. or could be better. Uh, and frankly... What I'd like to see is more of what what my team at work are like with that that concept. Um, when we have an idea for something to be better, uh, say with an individual animal or enclosure, uh, or, or maybe an idea that something isn't good enough, we get excited. Mm-hmm. We get really excited because that means we can do something big. We can do have, we can start a project. We can improve an animal's welfare. We can watch it do something even better, something cool, and have a better life. And that's that's really the kind of mentality I'd like to see hobbyists have. Yes, and some well, definitely I know ex- do. 
but not enough. Yeah, absolutely. And I know exactly the feeling. Like I'm in the process of re- redoing a lot of things or, or planning on redoing a lot of things for the next few months in here. And it does just fill me with so much excitement. And and quite often I'll hear from people, and th- this episode will, will be no exception because of the, the topics that we discussed. I'll hear from people after this that say, I am so fired up about keeping reptiles right now. And, you know, everybody goes through a slump of like, oh, man, it's like me recently. I had a baby four weeks ago. So no the way. reptiles became on the, the back burner like immediately. Yeah. And and you, you kind of go into a slump of care and just go through the paces. And mm. sometimes you need a, an exciting conversation with someone to fire you back up and go, oh mm. my gosh, I remember why I love keeping these animals so much and here's some things I want to do. So yeah. that is what's great about having you know conversations with people in person. And, and uh, I'm sure the conference will send everybody home with plans uh, to change what they're doing already fingers crossed fingers crossed and ultimately no one person knows everything about 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 these animals and each part of their husbandry and science um and and we shouldn't be offended by not knowing we should be excited by not knowing because we can learn something else something new hopefully by uh, from someone that's really really enthusiastic and into exactly. that topic which is where a conference is really good because you get loads of people talking about the thing that they're really interested in and you can just vibe and 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 and, and experience off their excitement and interest well i do hope that eventually we do get one back in north america because i would love to go to it's obviously a lot easier for me to get to the states than it is to get to the uk <laughs> cheaper yeah. as well and i know many of the listeners are in the in the united states as well so we could probably have a, a big flock of people headed to that conference so hopefully mm-hmm. in the next year or so that happens because i would love that and mm-hmm. and i know that you're also recording and 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 doing the audio visual for the conference this weekend and yes. I, I think these plans are still up in the air so we don't have to talk about anything solid but i know the listeners who didn't get to experience will be asking is is there any way that they can eventually watch the talks that happen yes. this weekend? so fingers crossed this will all go well and i know you can't you, you guys listening won't be able to fingers crossed because it will have already happened good or bad mm-hmm. <laughs> hopefully it will uh, essentially i am going to try and film the conference from start to finish all of the talks um put it into a professional format uh, you've seen how anal i am with the youtube video so hopefully that comes out quite well after how many months it might take me to put all that together um i've got my room the, my living room is currently a mess of equipment of cameras uh and wires ready to uh, set up on friday night um and hopefully we will be able to host that somewhere for anyone to watch i have no idea yet about the specifics of where or how but those videos will be produced for everyone to be able to watch um somehow so hopefully what what comes out of the conference will not just be restricted to the uh, 100 and something people that will actually attend mm-hmm. um it's important that those people attend we need the footfall to fund conferences like this um and ultimately again what's the point of doing it without some kind of social but the benefits of it shouldn't be restricted to just those people um, well, the whole hobby think- should benefit yeah, yeah, exactly. The whole hobby should benefit. But I also do think that if people are watching it video on demand style after the conference, I, I don't think anybody would be opposed to paying for that service. I don't know, I'm not sure if that was something that people that you guys were already considering, but I'm sure people would be willing to pay to help fund because uh, it, it is important that we are using our dollars to promote mm. the things in the hobby that are doing the right things and pushing us in the right direction. And I don't think anybody yeah. would be opposed to because how much does it cost to actually go in person to the conference? Uh, so to attend it, it's uh, if you wanted to do both days, it's fifty five pound a person. This yeah. one, um, so plus pretty another inexpensive. twenty something for a meal. Yeah, if you go for the evening meal, so it, it's expensive. It's far more expensive to attend it than. Well, it I, no, I was going to say inexpensive. To me, that doesn't sound like. I mean, the, the <laughs> amount of value that you're going to get out of that is is. Mm. I think that's inexpensive. You have all these conversations with people, and you're going to get to be there in person, and yeah. and I think that's pretty invaluable. But to watch it online to pay a little bit i don't think that would be too much to ask and something brilliant from it as well which uh people that uh already attended or at least closely followed our previous conferences is at the end of every conference we do make a donation Mm -hmm. um so we don't keep all the money from it in fact uh all of the organizers um still buy our own tickets um i bought my ticket i'm not being paid to film it either Mm -hmm. um we're paying uh, we're we're funding ourselves to attend it and to stay at hotels 
uh, and at the end of the conference, uh, a certain amount of money, we don't know exactly how much yet, it's to be decided, but will be going to charity. Um, and usually the hosts, Drayton Manor, um, so Chris Mitchell, the zoo manager, usually gets to announce it and choose um, a good charity for that money to go to. That's um, awesome. And it's happened every conference and we are still going to carry on with that. That That's great and to then, hear. The, the rest of the money gets put into a pot to um, afford future conferences. Well, well and I, I don't see any reason yeah. not to keep that pot growing because, like I said, it, you can have mm. more of these across the world. I mean, I think every yeah. hobbyist who's in this mindset as far as advancing has no issue chipping in a couple of dollars to make sure these continue to happen and then also pay for the information. It's like you yeah. said, people are traveling thousands of miles and putting together these lectures. Not everything has to be free. And I, I, I do the reason I, I push so hard on this topic is because I think some people are afraid to to make money in a way and then they don't they want to make it seem like they're being very charitable. But in some ways, money makes the world go round and we need to make sure yeah. that we're promoting the right things and because the money is going to end up somewhere else anyway so yeah. <laughs> if if we can promote the good things i think it's it's beneficial yeah we're very very scared to try and put money in our own hands uh um which we absolutely don't want to do so uh every every penny that goes through either funds the current conference or future conferences or the donation um mm. at those conferences so all of the money goes into um that sort of stuff uh as well as allowing th things like allowing speakers to be funded to come to us exactly and stay or uh in all the conferences we also do something for education we tend to um, have students come from various colleges that have done herpetological um projects uh, for example, at this one, we've we've got five students coming from from various places. One to do a talk on the work they've done. So we haven't just got lots of um, you know big names. We're also bringing a, a student in to talk, and then a group of students to uh, that have produced posters on their projects that are going to be able to be seen um, at the conference, and people can speak to them about the work they've done. Because education, I mean, it's obviously important to me. Um, but it's also important to everyone else on the organizational team. Um, I'm I'm not the only teacher on there, so to speak. Yeah. Um, well, it's, uh, we, we try and do some good stuff with that. Yeah, I, I'm very looking forward. I, I wish you guys luck. I hope this whole weekend goes very smoothly, and I do hope that I can get my uh, eyes on some of the the lectures at the end of it in in, you know, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I'm sure it'll be a couple of months before you compile it all together because there will be some gold there. And uh, and like yeah, I said, hopefully we get one in North America at some point in the next year or so. Yeah, yeah. And if people, uh, ultimately, I mean, interest would push things like that. Um, if pe people come together and, and, de and demand it, tell us you want it to be somewhere mm -hmm. and tell us why, tell us how, <laughs> and, and, and hopefully we'll come and do it. Um, because like I said, with, with, with this one, uh, it's footfall that makes these conferences enough people need to attend for them to succeed. Yeah. As long as enough enough people att attend, we can make a really brilliant modern information conference out of it. Yes. Well, there's a call to action for somebody. If you have a good location, if you live somewhere where you think would be a great host for a, for a conference, yeah. let's do it. You can even reach out to me because I, I know I'm obviously uh, in contact with most people at uh, Advancing Herpetological Husbandry, and I can make those connections very, very easy. Absolutely. And, and like I said, a host is, is one of the, actually the biggest uh, costs and, and things like the the US one we did, uh, the Chiricahua Desert Museum, were absolutely brilliant to us. And we, we, we couldn't have hosted it without them there. Uh, every year here in the UK, we host it at Drayton Manor um, Hotel, which have their, their own zoo park as well. Um, and they are massive, massive supporters and pushers of us. And it takes that kind of support for us to host something like this rather than just buying out a big room. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it takes the push of the people there. As yes, well. absolutely. Well, Ricky, I think we could continue talking for hours and hours, so we should probably start <laughs> wrapping it up. Is there anything that we didn't cover today that you wanted to mention before we officially uh, turn <sighs> off the record button? I think I, we hit almost everything. I think I've gone through loads, yeah. Yeah, yeah you sure have. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate this conversation. Uh, this will be, like I said, this is a conversation that I know will motivate people and, and get people fired up to to change things and to think about things in a different way. And I'm going to send a lot of people over to your channel as well to watch yeah. the videos and we'll be watching for the next ones. Can you let everybody know where they can find the, the videos as well as maybe contact for yourself or if you have an Instagram or, or anything like that? 
Um, I'm most easily uh, contacted through Facebook. So if you're, uh, t- to be honest, so if you're already on uh, Advancing Herpetological Husbandry, I am one of the admins. So you can uh, you can go on there and find the, the the admins of said group, and it's just Ricky Johnson on there, um, or straight through Herp HQ. So you can contact through uh, the YouTube. I do monitor the comments on those those videos. Um, and I'll, I do try and reply to every one of them if I can, um, or through the page, the Herp HQ page, which you'll get through to me or Sam. Um, and if it's for me, Sam will poke me to look at it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for spending the time with me this afternoon or this evening on your end and, That's fine. and, uh, for making the fantastic videos and doing the conference work and you're, you're really a, a good, strong member of, of the hobby. And it was a blast chatting with you. Fingers crossed. <laughs> thank you for having me. And ultimately, as long as animals do better out of the work we do, um, it's all worth it. All right, that is the end of that episode. Ricky, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. And I've spoken to several people already who actually attended the conference because now it has already happened. And it went off without a hitch. It sounded like it sounded like it was an amazing time, some incredible speakers. So like I said in the intro and during the last little bit of conversation there, I am hoping I can actually see some of those presentations because I know there's a lot to be learned there. So thank you for putting the, the conference together or helping putting it together and joining me on the podcast and making such great videos. Listeners, if you enjoyed the, po- the podcast or the conversation let us know in the youtube comments or send us a message on instagram or comment on the post on instagram we really love hearing from everybody let us know which part of your conversation was the favorite can you add anything to the conversation i'm sure you can there's so much depth in these topics on reptile emotion and intelligence as well as just general husbandry are we doing this correctly how much more space should we be providing these animals it's definitely some interesting topics and like i said in the episode i'm starting to come up with a little bit of sort of ethical ethical conundrum in my own mind and how much space should i really be providing these animals and i feel like i need to be providing a lot more so that'll be my next goal and hopefully you have similar goals as well if you are looking for more information on this episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Show notes for every episode that has been recorded are there. If you would like to join us on Patreon, head to patreon.com slash animalsathome. You can support the show for as little as $3 a month. You can also bump up to a $5 a month tier if you like. And as I said through the intro, because my life has become a lot more busy, I am very, very seriously considering outsourcing my editing, which will probably cost me around four or $500 a month, probably closer to $500 a month US, which means if I can, I don't even want to convert it to Canadian. So if you are enjoying the show and you want to help support financially, Patreon is a really great way to do that because I do want to get back to consistent editing. I just don't think I'm capable of spending 15 to, you know, whatever hours per week editing episodes. It's just taking too much out of me right now. And I'm happy to have someone pay for it, I think, but we want to make sure the show stays financially viable. So if you are enjoying it, Patreon is the best way to do that. And finally, thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for new reptile enclosures, make sure you go check out their website. There are affiliate links in both the show notes as well well as the YouTube description. And if you don't know what an affiliate link is, if you click on that link and you end up making a purchase at no extra cost to you, I do get a commission from that purchase, which means just by simply supporting the sponsor, you will also be supporting me. And that really helps keep the lights on in the show. And like I said, maybe pay for editors in the future. Okay. I think that is it for me rambling today. Thank you guys so much for listening and I will catch you in the next episode.